So hello everybody, I'm Katie Karkek and it is my pleasure tonight to welcome Kristen Kessler, did I say yeah. that right? Um, yes, did. thank you. Good, uh, to the Scarsdale Library to talk to us a bit about what a doula can do to help. So I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Welcome Ellen, welcome Chris and Katie. Thank you everyone. Thank you to the Scarsdale Library for having me. Uh, very excited to be here. I'm pretty local, I'm in Mount Vernon, so not so far away. There we go. <laughs> um, little fun technical. Oh, wait, I can't hear you, Katie. I was trying to mute everybody else. Sorry. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> um, <We moved. laughs> I'm sorry. Should I share my screen or will you? Right yeah, that's okay. Yeah, you All can right. share your screen. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen, Chris and Ellen, um, so that everyone can see the presentation, um, and I will repeat this at the end, but the presentation will be available um, for participants and for, you know, use, basically. Um, the other thing I will say is that I have some client pictures in here that I have been given permission to use. Um, so while they're not up close and personal in sense of like seeing someone give birth, they are um, intimate in, um, you know, one way. So I have permission to use them. Um, and yeah, so if you do want to share um, this, just just know that, but also just know that um, to, um, to have that in the back of your head. Can you see the presentation? Okay, great. So we're gonna talk about birth, postpartum, lactation, um, everything in between and how a birth doula or a postpartum doula can help you or help someone that you know or love um, or someone that you just, you know, feels needs the help or wants the help and doesn't know how to get it um, and sort of everything in between. I am open for questions. Um, you can, you know, unmute yourself and ask me or you can save it to the end. We can, we'll probably have some time to chat at the end. Um, so again, I'm Kristen Kessler. Um, I am the owner of Whole Soul Doula, which can sound like a mouthful sometimes and I trip over it. Um, I am a lifelong entrepreneur. So as soon as I could work and make some money for myself, I did. Um, and I have been doing that ever since. Um, I'm a birth and postpartum doula. I have been certified um, from Manhattan Birth through DONA, which is doulas of North America. Um, I'm a lactation consultant as well. So um, help people troubleshoot uh, breast and chest feeding. And I'm also an owner of an HR consulting business, um, which is fun and sort of, it can be, it's, during the pandemic, it's been pretty crazy in terms of people having babies, but also returning to work, needing help to return to work telling their employers that they are pregnant or have had a loss um, and also dealing with schedule changes, um, promotions, raises, you know, before and after um, childbirth and before and after uh, paternity and maternity leave. Um, so I officially became a doula in June of 2020. I had been attending births and doing birth work prior to that. Um, so this is my, this was my sort of official way of making it, um, you know, legal, I guess, in terms of the IRS. Um, and that's also when I made it an LLC. So, um, so that was fun. I'm a current member and um, mentors, uh, mentors, master's mentee, excuse me, at Manhattan Birth. Um, Manhattan Birth is sort of my go-to community for anything birth related. Um, if there's something that's out of my scope, I go to my cohort within Manhattan Birth. Um, I'm also a pre and uh, postnatal performance training specialist, um, which was through pronatal fitness. So it helps um, people get ready for the longest marathon of their life, uh, which is giving birth. And it helps you, the, their programs help you really prevent injury and speed up recovery um, so that you're even stronger after this marathon. Um, and lastly, this is one of 
my most exciting things right now is I am a former corporate HR participant. So I'm no longer commuting into the city. Um, I haven't been for about two years, you know, just about the time of the start of the pandemic until uh, the end of March. I left my corporate HR job to do um, doula and private HR work on my own. Um, so it has been a pretty good six weeks so far. It's been a little nutty, um, but no more working for the man. Um, so again, the, the photos that I have used in this presentation, um, I have obtained permission from the people who have taken the pictures of. Um, all of them are clients. And um, I just ask that if you forward this on to anyone that you just let me know. Um, and none of the information within this presentation is medical advice. Um, I will always caution clients, friends, relatives, anyone to seek medical care from you know, either their midwife, their OBGYN, their general doctor. I can only talk about what I know as um, an unlicensed medical professional. Okay, uh, so with that, we will get started. Um, and before we really get into the nitty gritty, I do like to remind people that regardless of the way that they deliver, in which they deliver their babies, it's natural. So at Manhattan birth, they like to say, you know, did you deliver um, through the chute or the sunroof? Um, and so it's sort of, you know, it, it, it lightens it a little bit. Some people are very attached. I have a client right now um, who is very attached to having um, a vaginal birth. However, baby is breech unexpectedly at 36 weeks, and she might have to go in for an induction and a C-section. So all of these plans, you know, can go sort of out the window um, based on what baby does and what um, really is meant for your body. So I like to remind my clients that regardless of the way in which they birth their baby, it's natural. You know, the baby has been carried in their body for, you know, however long they go to um, in gestational weeks. They have greatly changed their lives, their future plans, everything, you know, up until this point has been, well, since, you know, uh, from conception up until this point has been changed, altered, um, and sort of adjusted a little bit to welcome this child. Um, and they have also created a space and grace to welcome their child into the world. Um, so, you know, vaginally um, delivering a baby is one way. Having a C-section is just another way as well. So there are no subpar births um, and any way that you birth your body is a natural way. Okay. So what do, what do I do? What, why should someone hire a doula? Um, so I basically kind of run the gamut in terms of duties. Um, if I am, a, if I'm attending a birth or I'm supporting someone who is currently pregnant, um, I support the families or the pregnant person, um, while they navigate their choices, while they talk to their doctors or their midwives. Um, I give them evidence-based information. I, you know, direct them to ACOG, which is the American College of Gynecology, or to scholarly articles. Um, Australia has some really good, um, some really, really good um, scholarly articles that I like to point people to, especially for um, breast and body feeding. I support them uh, physically. Sometimes people need literally to, to hold my hand, uh, even during an appointment, or if they're pushing, you know, I'm holding their leg or whatever it is. I offer physical support, um, emotional support as well. You know, for some people, um, it is a very, very emotional, for most people, it's a very, very emotional time in their lives and, you know, their families' lives. Um, and hormones, you know, change rapidly. And with that usually comes a change in emotion. Um, so I'm supporting them with information, uh, with the ability to show up with space and holding space for them. Um, and this is through the, the, po the prenatal and the postpartum period. So some of these things um, that I do also can look like helping someone create their birth plan. Um, and again, like I said, you know, my client 
wanted to deliver vaginally, she might have an induction and have a C-section. So a birth plan, I try to explain to people, is sort of like a preference sheet. You can have a birth plan that's six pages long, and I did have someone who had a birth plan that was six pages long, front and back, of you know their must-haves and their you know their wants, desires, and if this, then that. If not this, then that. This is you know this intervention, not that intervention. This medication. So I help people really tailor and focus on their top three things. Um, sort of like they're really nice to haves um, because again, things can just go you know, out the window based on uh, the medical situation. I help people with feeding their baby, whether they choose to breast body feed or um, give their baby formula, there is no you know, right or wrong way to feed your baby. The baby just needs to be fed. Um, so I help people navigate that. Um, you know, hand expressing, understanding what colostrum is, harvesting colostrum, um, if, you know, they decide to body feed or researching formula, um, anecdotally understanding or, or communicating the information about formula to my, um, to my clients. I also help them navigate the very oversaturated baby market. Um, some people hire me just to help them with their baby shower, organizing their nursery and baby proofing their home. Um, you know, a little head can get stuck underneath uh, a cabinet or, you know, a bookcase or something. Um, so I'm looking out in clients' homes for those spaces to make sure that they're welcoming baby into a very safe um, environment. And also helping them understand you don't need three different pumps. You don't need 16 different swaddle or, you know, baby swaddlers. Um, you don't have to have the $1,500 stroller, what you can afford, what you actually need, you know, is very, looks very different from every, for everyone. So, um, while everyone wants to have the nicest and the best and the brightest, um, you know, you just, you don't have to spend all this money. You're going to continue to spend money once the baby comes. Um, so I help people sort of just, uh, scale it down a bit so that they're also not tripping over all of these items in their homes. Um, I help with care provider references and connections. Um, so within the birth world, you know, news travels fast. Um, and if someone has a very good experience or a very bad experience, that information will come to us. Um, and so I offer the resources without, um, you know, my opinion in there without the anecdotal. And if, you know, if it's really, really bad, then I wouldn't pass on information. Um, but I do offer a lot of referrals. Um, a lot of people, you know, with the aches and pains of pregnancy, look to do um, alternative medicine type um, appointments. So whether that is Chinese medicine and they're going for acupuncture or they're going for chiropractic work, um, specifically the Webster method for chiropractic work for uh, pregnant people, or they are looking for a masseuse. Prenatal massage can be very, very helpful, you know, regardless of what stage of the pregnancy this person is in. I'm also working to nurture the family um, in the postpartum period, which is also known as the fourth trimester. Um, a lot of people, if this is their first time having um, a full term pregnancy and, and labor and delivery, um, are very overwhelmed. And I don't have children myself, but being in this situation so many times, it can be overwhelming for everyone who is involved, including the spouse, including you know the in-laws or the other support people. So it's very important that there is some sort of semblance of um, care, connection, understanding that this is a very, very tender time and people need as much space, grace, quiet also that they, you know, that so that they can heal appropriately, so that they can rest, so that they can be present and enjoy their baby as much as they can. Um, I also offer lactation support. Again, if people choose to body feed, um, reassurance, empowerment, encouragement, and supporting anything that I can um, 
in their home as well. So if that looks like, you know, cooking a meal for them or helping them organize their groceries or whatever it is, um, you know, doing the baby's laundry, doing the birthing person's laundry, um, so that, you know, it's one less thing for them to do. Um, I'm also helping them obtain more information, um, you know, wherever that information is coming from, again, the, the sources that I use, so that they have the information that they can, um, that they feel is necessary in order to make informed decisions. Um, so we never want anyone to make a decision in haste um, or without proper um, citation or, you know, backup, so that they feel like that was the best decision for them. Okay. Um, a couple of things that people can consider if they would like to hire a doula um, for either birth or postpartum work is, um, you know, you consider if you are a first time parent, right? This is a new experience for everyone, including the baby. Um, so sometimes, again, that can be very overwhelming and people just need an extra hand. They have either had a traumatic birth experience or a traumatic and upsetting pregnancy experience. A lot of clients have come to me and have told me that they have had miscarriages or, you know, or they delivered a stillbirth or, you know, what, or had a stillbirth delivery, whatever the case may be for some people, birth can be very traumatic, even if you do have a, you know, a normal delivery, labor and delivery. Um, people want a little help navigating the process and navigating care providers. Um, some people hire doulas if they have a lack of community or a lack of um, close family members or friends nearby. I had a client um, who moved here from Canada for her husband's job. So it was just the two of them um, and she was seven months pregnant. Um, so a late transfer, all of that, late hire, um, but they really needed, you know, navigating, uh, help navigating the U.S. hospital system and understanding, you know, certain protocols. Everyone in Canada apparently has a doula for their birth, and she thought it was bizarre that, you know, not everyone had a, uh, has a doula here. Um, so, it, you know, it, I think it should be, you know, something that everyone who is pregnant has um, and wants um, if, if they if they can do it. Um, if they have children already, um, it's, you know, super helpful to hire a doula if you have one or two children already because you're overwhelmed with that as well on top of your pregnancy. Um, if you're working or if your partner is working, if you have a partner and the partner is working, um, you know, just a little extra support can go a really long way. And some doulas offer sibling doula um, services. So that means that um, the doula is, wor is working with the sibling or siblings um, while the parent or parents take care of the newborn. Um, again, if you're not familiar with the hospital system in the US or hospitals or birthing centers in general, some, sometimes when people give birth, it's the first time that they've ever been, to, been into an um, are admitted in, in a hospital. So, um, you know, sometimes they can also feel pressure from providers or doctors because they're in the white coats. You know, they've gone through a lot of schooling. They have all of these credentials behind their name and that can be intimidating to some people. Um, finding your voice in that situation, uh, in any medical situation can be intimidating for people. Um, or you just want extra help and support in general. Um, you know, even if you have given birth before, like I said, the extra hand can really go far for some people. <clears throat> um, three things that doulas do not do. Uh, this is this was an incredible birth, um, but um, we do not perform clinical um, tasks or checks. Um, so no like, vaginal exams, no breast exams, anything like that. Um, we do not give medical advice or make medical decisions for our clients. Um, and again, we do not make any kind of decision for or on behalf of the client. Um, so we can suggest um, things, we can offer alternatives, but we cannot say this is what you have to do or this is what you must do. That is totally out of my scope in any medical situation. 
Um, so what does a good doula look like? You know, a good, a good doula. How can I tell if I've got someone who is experienced if you do decide to work with a birth or postpartum doula? Um, and it comes down to your personal preferences, right? So it's, you know, you're interviewing people, they're interviewing you back. Um, it's different for everyone because every single person and every physical body has different needs um, and their wants are different, are going to be different as well. Um, and once baby arrives, your needs and wants will change just like the baby is changing every single day. Um, so it can be difficult sometimes in the postpartum period to say, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do this, and then that. Um, because again, baby can, you know, take a left turn and, and everyone else wanted to only make right turns that day. Um, however, typically, in my opinion, a strong doula um, is intuitive, is someone who can pick up on nonverbal cues um, because one or both parents are, or, you know, uh, birthing people or the birthing person is overwhelmed. So using your intuition, I like to call it my doula spidey sense. Um, I sort of just try to pick up on what's going on as soon as I arrive and um, ask for permission. Can I do this for you? Would you like it if I X, Y, and Z? So you give them options. It's less for people to think about. And you just sort of take in the environment um, and, you know, do what, what you think is, is right in your gut. Um, a good doula will, will be capable and aware enough to hold that space for their clients as well. Um, sometimes, you know, people just want to talk to you. They haven't had a conversation with an adult if they're partner or if they're a single parent by choice. You know, they haven't spoken to anyone during the day. So they want someone to have a conversation with and to sort of digest the, the day or the information or what's been going on or how much they haven't eaten or slept or showered or even brushed their teeth. Um, I think a good doula, a strong doula will always act um, in an empathetic, sympathetic and compassionate way, even though all of those are very different and appropriate at different times. Um, a good doula will know when to be empathetic, when to be sympathetic and when they need to show compassion for the birthing person. Um, they will always put their clients needs and wants first. My opinion um, in any situation doesn't matter. I tell my clients that when I am interviewing, what I would do doesn't matter. Um, what you want to do matters and what you are going to do matters. And I'm going to support you in your decisions, regardless of what I think of that, because that's what I'm here to do. Um, so we never judge or criticize their decisions or what is going on in the situation. Um, we show up with good energy, positivity, and grace. Um, so those are just a few things um, that I think. And then a few things to consider when you're hiring or interviewing um, a doula for birth or, or the postpartum period. Um, I ask my clients or, you know, I advise them to choose on an energetic level. So if off um, the cuff, you, you know, you meet someone, whether it's over Zoom, whether it's over a phone call, I'm going to um, take a walk in a park tomorrow with a prospective postpartum client. So whatever the way in which you're meeting is, you will be able to tell um if you match their energy just like if you can tell you know the barista at starbucks you know is really having a good day or not this is also how you can tell it's it's sort of like an energy match and you are going by cues um take note of your thoughts and feelings when you are having this conversation right based off of your interactions as well so have they scheduled the appointment with you or did you um, did you send them a calendar invite? You know, I, I like to put things on the calendar because I live and breathe by my calendar. So once someone says, yes, I would like to, or they schedule the appointment themselves, um, I send a confirmation, I reach out, introduce myself, all of that. Um, the initial communication is very important, I feel, in setting the tone um, and showing that you're a professional. Have you looked at their website? What's on their website? Are there grammatical errors? I mean, sometimes that's not a big deal for some people, but to me, that shows attention to detail. And are they going to show me the same attention um, to, or give me the same attention and detailed work uh, while they're showing up for me in this very tender moment? 
um, you can ask them what their experience have been like, has been like with other clients. So is this their first birth experience? Is this their fifth or their 50th? Um, how experienced are they? That is a very important question for some people. It's not a very important question for other people. I've had, you know, I still get this question, how many births have you attended, but not from every person. Um, if you Google, you know, what questions do I ask a doula while interviewing, that will come up quite frequently. Um, and it's still okay, you know, even I now in, in after all these years, I still have people ask me for references. So that's a very good thing to do. I think it shows that you really do care about who you're, you know, welcoming into your space um, and quite frankly, your home. Um, so I sort of expect this sometimes, um, or some people make the decision themselves and they feel confident in that as well. Um, some people ask what my qualifications are, if they haven't looked at my website or, um, you know, it wasn't a word of mouth referral. Um, they asked me what my, my qualifications are and why, um, why I became a doula. Um, you can also ask, um, what or you can consider what you and or your partner if you have one um what your needs are when you are vulnerable what are you looking for in terms of support when you are sick when you are recovering from surgery um you know or when you've had a really really hard day what does the support look like to you so that you can feel better, you can heal faster, you can get back to yourself. No one's ever going to bounce back because they didn't go anywhere um, while they were pregnant. Um, so, you know, when you are in this vulnerable position, what kind of support are you looking for? And you're going to consider the needs of the birthing person first and then the rest of the family. Um, they are the ones who are, you know, going through this mind, body, and soul. Um, why are we looking for support or why am I looking for support um, for this birth or postpartum period? What are my expectations of the support person? Um, and am I comfortable with being totally exposed to someone who is not my partner, a family member, or a very close friend? Um, some people don't think about that until we're in the hospital and they're like, oh my God, I'm gonna be naked in front of you. Like I've had a lot of people say that. And, um, you know, it's something that you just don't think about sometimes. And then of course, um, you know, what is my, or what is the, the family's budget for these services? Um, a lot of people uh, can add, will want to add things on and then they say, oh, you know, we only had this, you know, X amount budgeted for that. And then they feel like they, have to pick and choose. Um, so it's important to understand what the budget is for this type of care. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't realize, um, and I've reminded a lot of my clients and prospective clients is that they can pay for doula services with pre-tax dollars um, in a health savings account. Or if so, if they have a health savings account or their partner has a health savings account, they can use those dollars to reimburse themselves because this is a, a a medical service based well it's a medical event and then they have support for that um so as long as they have backup information i always send invoices they can reimburse themselves from their hsa account flex spending account so fsa if their employer offers that or if their spouse's employer offers that um are not as um, easily reimbursable to the person. HSA is a little bit safer. Um, so that that's a whole nother beast uh, and a whole nother presentation to be quite honest in terms of how you can pay and how you can reimburse yourself. Um, I had a client pay for a postpartum meal service um, for six weeks from her health um, reimbursement account, which is a little bit different from an HSA, but um, so there, people get really creative so that they can get the help that they need and pay for it. Okay, so a few birth scenarios, right? So um, vaginal birth can be spontaneous or you can have an induction. So this is one way to give birth. Um, so spontaneous means, you know, either you contractions are starting or your water breaks. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, you're always going to know when your water breaks because um, it's going to be that Hollywood gush or that Hollywood puddle, uh, you know, while you're in Bloomingdale's or something, but that's not always the case. Um, 
people are induced for many different reasons, right? I, I said at the beginning of the call, my client could be induced because the baby has now flipped and is breech. Um, some people have uh, high blood pressure, preeclampsia um, symptoms, and that can be a reason for induction. Or they simply are done with being pregnant. They want to have this baby um, and understand that the, the whole process could take three days, quite honestly. So you could be induced on a Monday and have your baby on a Wednesday. It's a very long process, um, sometimes, not all the time. And then inductions also could lead to a C-section. So um, with good intentions, right? Um, everyone who um, you know thinks in their birth plan they're going to have a vaginal birth and then they end up with a C-section um, and they also had an induction you know, somewhere in there, um, it is, it's possible. Any birth you know, could end in C-section or could just be a C-section. So we then have a planned C-section um, with epidurals or, or a spinal. Um, sometimes people have planned C-sections or they, they opt to have um, a planned C-section if the baby is breech. If they have placenta previa, um, placenta previa is where the placenta is, is covering the cervix. Um, or they have other health problems like preeclampsia or, um, you know, they're type 1 or type 2 diabetic and their sugars are not controlled. Or, you know, there's a, there's a whole host of reasons as to why someone would plan um, a repeat uh, or a, a C-section. And then the number one reason for uh, repeat cesarean or for a cesarean uh, for your second birth is because you had one in the first for your first birth. Um, that's, you can have a, a, a vaginal birth after a cesarean, it's called VBAC. Um, there are a few providers who will support that. Not everyone will support that type of delivery. And then there's the unplanned cesarean. Um, this happens sometimes when there's failure to progress. I put that in quotes because I don't believe it's a failure. Your body is resting when it's you know stopped progressing for some time. Your body understands that you know this is a long process, and we need to store some energy. We need you to rest. Um, sometimes in the hospital, they have uh, time limits on this. So if the person is five centimeters dilated, and they've been laboring for 18 hours, um, you know six hours later they haven't dilated anymore. They'll call that failure to progress um, or failure to progress. Um, and that sometimes can lead to an unplanned C-section. If there are non-reassuring uh, fetal heart tones, so um, you know, if, if the heart monitor spikes and then it goes, um, you know, really dips and then spikes again and then it dips and spikes. So something like that where it shows that baby's um, in distress they, and it's for a certain amount of time, they will suggest, uh, they will strongly suggest a, um, a C-section. Now, emergency c-sections a lot of people will tell you i had an emergency c-section um but only th about three percent of cesarean sections are true emergencies um sometimes that's a, a cord prolapse where the person has been laboring 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 and then they're they're going to push and then the umbilical cord is um is blocking the uh the birth canal um, so this is an extreme dire fetal, dire fetal distress. Um, they've lost a heartbeat or a mom, you know, something has happened with the mother or the birthing person. Um, so yeah, that makes up about 3% of the cesareans that happen within the United States. Um, this is one of my, I mean, these are both beautiful pictures, but, but this is um, little Sophia who's coming into the world just with her arms out. Um, that was in... February. So what does my doula do and what can I expect? So it's a little bit more about, so this is during labor. Um, so they help to um, support the physiologic process for birthing people. Um, so this happens, you know, early on when labor starts. So what are the early signs of labor? So it's cramping or irregular contractions. Um, some people experience Braxton Hicks contractions, which, you know, happen sort of lower in the belly um, and can be quite painful and annoying, to, to be quite honest with you. People 
think that they're going into labor and then it stops and then it happens again the next day and then it stops. And this can happen for a while um, for people in the third trimester. Um, so in you know, the early signs of labor, the contractions are not that strong. They're not lasting that long. You, know, you could have a contraction for 30 seconds and then six hours later have another one for 45 seconds. Um, three or, they're either typically three to 30 minutes apart. The six hours was a little bit of an exaggeration, but just you know, to show you. Um, an early physical sign is loose bowels, frequent urination, um, they're nauseous or they're just generally feeling unwell. And this is typically the time when I suggest that people call their midwife or their OBGYN um, to let them know that these are the, the symptoms that they're experiencing. And in terms of supporting early labor, um, doulas will remind you to rest, to hydrate, to eat as much as possible. Um, the recommendation is half a cup um, an hour to eat, um, but I, I'm, I always want my clients to be fully satiated so that if they do labor for a very long time, what they have eaten at home has really helped them and prepared them. Um, I am a big advocate for eating and drinking during labor. However, it's really not supported in a hospital environment. In birthing centers, in home births, it's a little bit different. Um, mainly, you know, the hospital's worried about people aspirating but um, it's very, very rare that that would happen. Um, but being you know, hydrated and fed is really important for you to carry out this labor. Um, and I also suggest that people move when they can. So if that means doing figure eights on a birthing ball or a physio ball, that's great to sort of loosen some joints and get the baby moving a little bit. Um, if they can walk, if they can do supportive movements or supportive yoga positions to help their body relax, to help um, get the baby to descend, that's also something that I suggest my clients do. Get into the shower. Um, standing under a warm shower can also just really help relax and, and help people center themselves. Um, also, it's nice for the baby. I also suggest that my clients stay home for as long as possible if this is what they're planning to do, um, because no one really wants to sit in, in a hospital for that long. No one wants to, you know, really like look at the clock and be like, I can't believe you've been here for 36 hours. Um, and they are checked in triage and they're a centimeter dilated before they admit them. So typically they'll tell people to go home if they're just a centimeter dilated, unless, you know, there's a different plan or their health um, implications there. Um, I also, you know, help uh, with communication. So I am in constant communication with my clients. Um, really, 38 weeks on, we, you know, communicate here and there um, weekly prior to 38 weeks. But um, you know, when there are signs of labor, we are communicating a lot. Um, I am present for them. It doesn't necessarily have to be physical presence. Some people, you know, want me to meet them at the hospital or the birthing center if this is a hospital or birthing center uh, delivery. But I'm offering comfort, reassurance, um, and just generally uh, supporting them in, in whatever way they would like at that time. Um, I always, if there is a partner involved, I will ask to speak to both people. Oftentimes the partner will call and say, you know, um, my wife or my partner is X, Y, and Z um, and has been for, you know, two hours. And I like to hear their voice because if this person cannot carry on a conversation, labor is, is picking up, honestly. Um, so I like to hear their disposition, if they're anxious, if they're you know, tired already. Um, so it's just good to, to talk to both people if there is a partner involved. Um, I like to offer reassurance um, and offer positional options for comfort. So again, whether that's helping your client move or, or having their support person who's with them um, help them move, I make suggestions um, and just make sure that they have the proper support if they are actually moving physically. Like getting in and out of the shower, in and out of the tub can be dangerous for someone who is in the early stage of labor. Um, and doing that, you know, you can collect the information through video, FaceTime, phone conversations, text. Um, this will help us decide on what the next step is for this person. 
Um, and I also remind my client to reach out to me, you know, whenever um, they need, if something changes, if they're nervous, if they feel like, you know, their heart is palpating, um, palpitating. And then uh, people always ask me, well, how do, I, how do I know if I'm in labor? How do I know when I need to go to the hospital? Um, and typically it is when contractions start to get stronger. You can feel a real, a real tightening um, at, the, above, at the top of your belly. Um, the contractions are stronger, they're lasting longer, and they're closer together. So my, my rule of thumb is 311. Um, so your contractions are three minutes apart, they're lasting a minute or longer, and this has been happening for an hour or more. Some people like 411, so four minutes apart, uh, or even 511. Some providers say 511 and then go to the hospital or the birthing center. Um, I always want my clients to rest as much as possible uh, because once you are admitted or once you're into the hospital, there's lights, there's sounds, there's smells, and it's hard to relax and, and rest sometimes. Um, a lot of people, you know, it'll be hard because they're excited. You know, the emotional signpost of the early stage of labor is excitement. Um, and so it can be hard for people to relax in this early stage. Um, because they might want to get things going. You know, they're, they're excited and they want to meet their baby, but they also need the energy to do this labor or to have this labor. Um, and then unless you've been, you know, your, your person or you have been, you know, laboring for um, days and you haven't slept uh, and you need medical support or you don't need medical support, I, I still encourage people to, to wait it out a little bit, um, but also to stay in constant communication with your care provider so that they know what's going on um, and can give you the medical advice. And finally, I like to remind people to listen to their gut and their intuition. Um, supporting the physiological process, again, still in active labor now. Um, you need active support, right? So now I'm physically with the person. Um, I'm helping them with relaxation, touch, and pressure. Um, this is where the partner can come in as well with the touch and pressure. Um, you know, some people are uncomfortable with someone other than their partner or family member touching them, so they don't want that. Some people don't want to be touched at all, regardless of who it is. Some people do. Um, I, you know, tell people to bring a barf bag wherever they go, um, you know, if they're even in their own home, if they don't have a trash can somewhere, um, it's good because the, um, the hormones will change rapidly and sometimes that causes people to vomit. Um, hydration, eight ounces an hour, um, electrolytes are really important, and then food, a half a cup um, an hour to really make sure that you're getting um, enough nourishment. And then I'm also offering encouragement. So the signs of, of active labor, um, bloody show is one of the really big signs. If you feel like, or the person feels like the baby is in their butt, people will say like, I really feel like I have to go to the bathroom, I have to poop. If they have rectal pressure, it's a good sign that active labor is either already starting or has begun. Um, if you're losing modesty, right, if people are put, peeling off clothes because they, it's so hot that they can't stand it, their, you know, their hormones are, are really um, kicking in here, they're losing modesty, that's another sign. Um, you know, they're exhausted, they want to lie down, um, and they're shaking, or they have hot and cold flashes, which is very normal. Um, because again, it's the hormones changing very quickly. The vocalization is if people are moaning. Um, you know, a lot of people seem uh, to think it's like very primal um, when someone is vocalizing like this in the, um, in the active labor phase. And again, the strong contraction. So this is where the 311 or 411 comes in. Um, and again, there's nausea and vomiting. And um, I like to describe this, this piece of labor as the person who's laboring has a do not disturb sign around their neck. And they're very serious and, um, you know, they, they sometimes can't carry on a conversation uh, and there's no laughing, there's no, <laughs> no joking. They're no longer excited, they're serious now. Um, okay, so then arriving to the hospital, um, you know, that's the 311 contraction, uh, contraction pattern, 
the rectal pressure. Sometimes people have a very strong um, sense to push or there's the bloody show. So any two of those three and it's time, it's really time to go. Um, your doula can meet you at the hospital or at the birthing center um, or at your home. Um, people are going to bring birth uh, plan copies. I always print out a few copies of the birth plan so that, you know, in case the um, birthing person or the family forget to bring it, I have that with me. I like to introduce myself, myself after um, they're through triage so that I become, you know, well acquainted with the nurses because we will be interacting a lot um, and I will be there. I'm not leaving until, you know, this baby is delivered. So um, I like to really, you know, start a rapport as soon as possible. We get the room ready for birthing people. So if there is time, sometimes there's not time. Um, I try to make it as comfortable and non hospital or not. It, usually birthing center is pretty comfy, um, but as non, non um, cold as some hospital rooms can be. And whether that means essential oils for people or twinkle lights or, you know, nice spa music going, um, whatever they want um, is what I do. I uh, want to make sure that you have water, straws, pillows, blankets, anything, again, that will help the birthing person to feel comfortable and supported uh, and hydrated as much as possible. Your doula is going to help you work through contractions, um, help you work through conversations, because honestly, people can still, again, cannot um, hold conversations if they are really in the zone or their contractions are, are super strong. Um, Doulas can also, you know, when you're resting, if you get an epidural and you're going to rest for a little bit, um, we can go and get you food. If, if you are okay with eating or if, if um, your provider is okay with you eating during active labor, um, or if your partner, if you have a partner wants to eat, I can go and get people food. I oftentimes, I have to remember that I'm a human too, and I need to eat and use the restroom. Um, and uh, so, those are things that happen. Um, I will offer massage, again, just for relaxation, help people breathe, um, start with breathing patterns or, um, you know, a countdown basically so that they can get through the contraction. I can translate terminology if it's in, within my scope. So if someone, says, if a doctor or nurse says something that I don't understand, I will ask for further clarification. If I don't understand it, it's, to, it's typical that my clients won't understand it. Um, I'm there and doulas are there to be your cheerleader, um, to remind you and to remind the birthing person of their strength, um, to remind them that they are in charge, um, their body is in charge, their body will know exactly what to do and uh, remind you to, remind the person to use their voice. Um, I also help people advocate for themselves. I can't advocate for you, um, I can help you advocate for yourself. And that comes with a lot of the empowerment and uh, supportive decision making. Um, again, act as a non judgmental sounding board for people if they have questions, if they are unsure of making a decision, um, and help to keep the room as, as calm and peaceful as possible. It can get very hectic and loud and, and messy, um, but it is part of my job to sort of bring it, bring the energy level down so that the birthing person can really focus inward on the labor. And I'll also help people think through decisions. So what does it look like if I get an epidural um, now, you know, in triage? We suggest that people don't commit to pain meds in triage because you can't go backwards from that. Um, so what happens if I need to have an episiotomy? What happens if I need to use forceps or the doctor needs to use forceps? Um, so really helping people through these decisions, through interventions if needed or if necessary. Um, there are some common challenges with any type of birth, whether it's uh, vaginal cesarean, induction, emergency C-section, things like that. Um, so having an epidural or having a spinal will make the birthing person uh, numb from their chest down. So typically um, that means that they can't get out of bed. Um, and for some people that's very scary. 
being confined to a bed while they're laboring in a, in a vulnerable state um, can be very scary for some people. Some people feel like they, they can't feel themselves breathe. Um, so much has taken over their body, you know, they can't concentrate. And it's, it's my job to help people to remember to inhale and exhale. And I oftentimes do that with people. Um, medications can also make people nauseous. So it can, they also can cause vomiting. Um, so this is also something where partners are not ready to either, you know, bring the barf bag over or bring the little, you know, kidney bean shaped thing over um, so that they can get sick into it. Um, but a lot of times people are vomiting. Um, shaking, so narcotics can, can make people shake. Um, a spike in hormones can make people shake. Um, it can be disturbing and unsettling to see, but it is unfortunately normal uh, and it will stop. And there also um, sometimes is a feel of disconnection or a feeling of disconnection um, to the action that's going on around you in this very intense um, situation. So, um, people call this behind the curtain so if you have um, a typical c-section and you have the blue screen or the blue curtain up and the doctors and the nurses are talking about you know i don't know politics or they're talking about the weather they're talking, and they're not talking to the person who is now completely exposed um having abdominal surgery and about to meet their baby and there's a disconnect um so oftentimes they feel um you know, not included in really the whole situation. So it's my, you know, my part of my job as a doula to make sure that the birthing person feels included, understands what's going on. Sometimes that means talking them through the procedure if the doctor is not doing that um, so that they understand exactly what's going on. Um, so this is just a, a chart of the total, this is a little outdated, honestly, they don't publish this information um, a lot, but um, the different types of hospitals, the number of C-sections, the rate in New York State, the total of um, primary cesareans, so planned, um, and so the conversion rates and all of that. So again, the number one reason for a cesarean is a repeat cesarean. Um, and then here, this is a link to the um, New York City Hospital uh, cesarean section rates. Um, so just a little bit on the cesarean um, birth procedure. Once you have a decision to have um, a C-section, so you've been laboring, I had a client for 36 hours. Um, she was, was trying to push, but it just wasn't happening. She was complete, you know, there was maternal exhaustion. They make a decision to have the C-section um, and then they sign consent papers. Um, this, this is time for feelings to happen a lot. So it's either excitement because they're going to meet their baby in less than an hour or it's disappointment or it's a combination of any of these things. Um, they're going to shave the person, give them by citrate, um, which is something that helps with the nausea from the medication. Um, and the partner, if there is a partner, gets to suit up so that they can go into the ER. Um, I always make sure that partners bring their phones so that they can take pictures, they can take videos while the birthing person is being um, prepped or cleaned up. They can take the pictures back over um, and show the birthing person. Um, they will have an epidural or a spinal um, in the ER if they already, if they haven't already gotten an epidural or a spinal. Um, and so if they have already gotten it, they'll give them a little bit of extra medication. They will be temporarily, so the birthing person will be temporarily separated from support or their partner um, while they're being prepped in the OR. Um, so this is also the time for the doula to really um, support the partner and help to answer questions um, and further uh, cheerlead for them, basically. Um, Post-procedure, uh, you know, the parents, again, will momentarily be separated um, while the uh, birthing person is moved to recovery. So hopefully this means that they have had, um, you know, a little bit of skin to skin if possible. They have um, taken some pictures so that they have that and they're going back to recovery. 
into a regular bed and not on the operating table. Um, the partner will typically be with, or the baby, excuse me, will typically be with the partner or support person during the transfer as they have to transfer the birthing person separately. Uh, but in some places they do keep um, baby and birthing person together. In recovery, the client can actually hold their baby um, and nurse if they feel like they're ready or nurse if that's their plan on uh, their method of feeding. Um, if someone feels shaky or, or sort of out of it, um, you know, it's, it's important to encourage the person um, to hold the baby when they feel that they are physically ready. Um, and the, you know, you're the, as the doula, you're going to remind clients um, to ask if, um, you know, the cesarean section uh, will cause them to be separated from their baby, if anything. So if the baby needs help with breathing, if the baby is unresponsive, things like that. So it's important even prior to, I should have put this in a different slide, if it's, it's important prior to the uh, procedure to ask what would be the reason for my baby and me and or my partner um, for, for the baby to be separate from us for an extended period of time. Um, this is one of my favorite things. So if people do have cesarean sections um, and their hospital participates in a gentle cesarean, this is my preference um, for my clients. And I, I give them a lot of information on cesarean or gentle cesarean. Um, so it's it's a little different from the clinical, typical um, cesarean section. There is a clear, instead of like blue or opaque um, drape, or they lower it so there is no drape. Um, pictures and videos are, are super, are really welcome. The parent or the partner can uh, cut the cord. They, some providers also offer delayed cord clamping, which is important um, because the blood, all of the blood from the umbilical cord can actually go into the baby. And six to seven ounces of blood is very important for a tiny little, a pe a tiny little peanut. Um, so they may offer delayed cord clamping in, in a gentle cesarean. Um, Sometimes the doula is allowed to support in the in the OR. Um, sometimes not. Um, sometimes you know the, the New York City hospitals or their operating rooms are four by four. You know it's so tiny that it, there's barely room in there for the stretcher, the doctor, and the nurse. Um, so sometimes doulas cannot be in the OR. Um, but if they are, they can you know stay with the the birthing person while the parent goes with the baby or vice versa. Um, the family is never separated in a gentle cesarean, and um, the baby is brought to the birthing person for skin to skin and um, can try to nurse if that's their plan um, right in the OR. So there are some very big differences here between the typical cesarean and then the gentle cesarean. There are great correlations between um, lowered rates of postpartum depression and greater success with nursing um, when there is a gentle cesarean section performed. Okay, um, if, you have a, if you have a client or if you have um, a scheduled C-section, what, what will your doula do with you? Um, or, or you know, how can they help you? I always, um, again, suggest that, that people consider gentle cesareans. Um, it also helps to get them excited about the, the cesarean process. Again, some people will feel disappointed that they have to have a cesarean section, but this can help them. We can discuss feeding plans and preparations, um, talking about postpartum recovery. Um, you know, when you have a giant incision like this, you will need extra help and extra care. Um, the day of the scheduled cesarean, um, sometimes people want their doulas there. Sometimes people just want them to meet them after the baby is born. Um, I've done both. So we meet at home or we meet at the hospital. Um, and when we meet at the hospital, I, I go or we meet at their home, I go with them and we show up as a team so that they feel like they're most supported in that way. Um, I can stay with the client or doulas can stay with their clients to help them. Um, remember what they should expect or, or remind them of the questions that they should be or want or have considered asking their providers. Um, and we can also help to answer questions in 
um, in the time and space that we have and also um, implement some relaxation techniques, quite honestly, um, and help them get excited and ready for this birth. Um, and just another reminder that there are no second class births. So if this turns into a scheduled cesarean when your plan was vaginal, not a second class birth. Um, what do the doulas do while the, the um, patient is having the procedure or are, are they in the OR with them? So talk about smells for the birthing person and their partner if they have one. Um, once the doctor cauterizes a person, it can be the, the smell of cauterization can be alarming to people. Um, I prepare people and their, their partners, um, if they have one, about seeing blood, about seeing organs, um, can be you know, very shocking to some people. Um, helping people remember that it's going to be cold in the operating room. So it's important for the partner to have, you know, a hoodie or a zip up or something so that they can not only do skin to skin with the baby if they have the zip up, um, but so that they stay warm. Um, and a lot of people feel that the C-section suit is claustrophobic. Um, so it's important again for the breathing techniques and the relaxation. Um, if the doula is outside of the OR, typically it'll be an hour of waiting. Um, sometimes you can switch out with the partner. Right now in COVID, that's really not happening at all um, to give them a break, but it's really dependent on the hospital procedures. And then you could have a sleepy uh, birthing person or possibly even a sleepy baby based on the amount of fluids and medication that, excuse me, have been administered. The client will spend three to four hours in recovery until um, they're feeling like they're more in touch with their body. Sometimes people can't feel anything at all. Um, and doulas will help with the skin to skin initial feeding and ensuring that um, you know the birthing person is, is comfortable. Um, they'll typically stay three days um, and three nights in the hospital. And uh, doulas will be in touch, you know, about lactation and feeding and overall client experience and their healing, how they're feeling. Um, sometimes people will come back to the hospital to visit their clients. Um, and then if the client and the baby were separated, the client may need some support from the doula in terms of lactation or hand expression if, um, you know, that's what they plan to do, pumping in the hospital, storing milk. Um, if they can, if they've been separated. Um, and then if, you're, if your doula is not a lactation expert, but has a little bit of, of general knowledge and um, support for you, they can give you or find people who are lactation experts. Um, and if you would like to nurse, if, you're, if your person would like to nurse, um, it's, you know, and they don't have experience or they seem to be having some trouble, hire a lactation consultant. It's, it's it can be very important for people if that's their plan. And then a final words on cesarean birth. Again, there are no second class births. Your body just, the body just ran a marathon. Um, I try to remind people not to assume uh, negative feelings around their cesarean section, uh, that their rest, nutrition, and gentle movement is very important. Some people feel absolutely fabulous after it. Um, others do not. It's typically they don't feel fabulous. Um, either way is normal. Um, and then, you know, your support team will really mean a lot to you and to the baby during this process. During the, the postpartum um, period, so the fourth trimester, you could consider hiring a postpartum doula. Um, and that helps you understand the, the postpartum doula will help you understand uh, postpartum period and what to expect, what um, to, what you might experience in this period of your life. Um, a lot of people may feel very emotionally liable during this, this time. Um, it's totally normal. There are baby blues and then there are postpartum mood disorders. Um, the two are very different. So being connected to other people who are also going through the experience, who have also had children is very important. Um, along with general understanding and compassion from your loved ones or your, your community. Um, postpartum depression or other postpartum mood disorders uh, can affect about 20% of people who deliver babies. Um, 
So if you are truly not feeling like yourself, you can't sleep, you know, you're overly anxious, you're not enjoying any, like there are things that you can enjoy if you've had a C-section or if you've had a vaginal delivery um, and you're, you know, sort of in the thick of it, if you're really truly having a difficult time, it's always important to call the doctor or the midwife. Um, you know, your doula can support you, but a, a licensed medical professional is the best. Um, I like to remind clients that whatever it is, um, whatever is happening, that they are able to handle it. They'll, we will work through it together. Um, and in most cases, people turn out much better and the situation turns out much better than they um, think. And then, um, you know, people sometimes are like, is this, is this really what my life is like right, right now? You know, it can be um, really, really great and life-changing once they have gotten through some of the tougher days and uh, recovery period. Um, people need to know their limits and honor them every single time. Um, so this can sneak up on you regardless of your delivery type in the first six weeks. <clears throat> people need to ask for help. It's really important that um, the birthing person, you know, uses their voice. And this is also, again, where a postpartum doula can help, um, you know, they, food, eating, garbage, laundry, walking the dog, feeding the cat, changing the litter, all of those things are very important in maintaining your household and maintaining a, you know, a healthy body. Um, so if you can hire help, that's great or you can find someone to help you just with these general um, do, you know, household duties. You don't want anyone who brings extra drama into the picture. So no one complicated during this, this period. Um, if you can get around, again, new um, people who have just had babies, that's also great. Um, there are new parent support groups or a La Leche League is also really good. Um, Again, just calling your midwife or your doctor if you have any symptoms that are that you are concerned about. Uh, protracted pain, if you are bleeding. Um, post period, postpartum bleeding is called lochia. And so if you are soaking a pad with lochia in less than an hour um, after the first week, that is not a good sign. Um, but especially uh, fever is not a good sign. So any of these things um, is reason to call your doctor or your midwife. Um, level of pain, soreness, all of that will depend on your birth and your body. Um, but you should be able to function. And if you are unable to function, if your eyes are swollen shut, if you're pale as a ghost, you're sweating, you know, fever, things like that, you should always call a doctor. Um, and I tell people, stop Googling. You know, it, it doesn't help because then you go from one end of the, the spectrum to the other. Um, call your doctor, call your care provider. While you're waiting for a response, you can reach out to your doula, but it is best for you, again, to have the true medical um, attention and advice. Um, a postpartum person's needs in the first week, number one is rest. Um, I tell people not to get out of bed unless they are going to the bathroom or just walking around for a little bit of movement for the first five days at minimum. Um, if you have a partner, everyone needs rest. Um, so if you can alternate naps, if there is a partner, or if you can, you have someone there with you, take a nap every single day within the first two weeks or so. Um, you know, you'll get little bits and pieces of, of sleep within um, a 24 hour period. Uh, and the babies typically sleep very well within the first two days. Um, but it will change and the babies will keep you up at night. Um, and it's normal for babies to keep you up at night, but they will eventually figure it out. Um, if you can hire help, um, again, that's great within the first week or the first two weeks. Um, but keeping the baby close is very important to helping people feel better and to healing and for healing. Um, you don't need to put a newborn on a schedule because they don't understand it. Um, you know, I'd be wary of people who are saying put the baby on schedule immediately because it's just it's a lot of stress and it's not um, necessary. They ch babies change rapidly and that schedule would change rapidly as well as well if you tried to do that. Um, the birthing person, the postpartum person should eat and drink as often as they can. Um, if a postpartum meal prep and delivery service, I offer that, um, if that's available to you, if that's something that you are able 
um, to access. I tell people to start it two weeks prior to their delivery so that they are very well nourished, very well hydrated, um, and that they can really run this marathon uh, with everything in them um, and that, you know, they just, they feel really prepared. Drinking plenty of water during the postpartum period is also super important. Um, they, if people are nursing, they're going to feel very, very thirsty. Um, feeding and bonding for the non-lactating parent. So uh, if your partner is not lactating, um, you know, the birthing person has had the sort of like roommate situation with the baby for the last nine to 10 months. Um, the only thing that you have to do, and if you want to and can, as the lactating parent is body feed uh, for the first few days that you're with the baby. Let your partner, if you have a partner, do everything else. Um, and that means changing the baby diapering, the baby, the clothes, burping, comforting, bathing. Um, babies don't really have to be bathed within the first two weeks of life, um, but let them really, let your partner, if you have a partner, help you. If your partner goes back to work soon after the baby is born um, and you have recovered a little bit more based on their involvement, um, you know, you'll have gotten some of those really, really good feelings um, and the practice down so you can start picking up a few things that they have done while you were recovering. And you can, you know, I really encourage people to let their partner, if they have one, care for this baby and care for you. And you will be very glad that you did after you get over this rough patch. Um, I have a lactation guide. So if people do want to access that, I'm going to put it in the chat. Oh, I see I have a chat here. Um, oh, seven days, Michelle. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, I can absolutely. Thank you. No worries. I can um, give you my information. I'll put this in the chat, but the lactation guide, um, oops, I'm sorry, is linked here. Um, and you can go to my website, you can download it. Um, it talks a lot about, um, you know, what your goals are, what, what you plan to do, how you can troubleshoot. And then I have a worksheet in there also um, for people to sort of work it out. Um, before they make decisions. Um, and then for people who you know, want to nurse, they want to consider if they've had any anatomical um, concerns for nursing. So have they had any trauma to the chest or breasts? Have they had top surgery? Have they had breast implants or augmentation or a breast reduction? These are some things that people um, you know, who have had those situations could, you know, lead to some, um, some difficulty in nursing, not always, but some, um, you know, how long is the baby nursing? Is the baby nursing for an hour and a half and still seems hungry? Um, you know, how many diapers has the baby had um, in a 24 hour period? How many wet diapers and how many poopy diapers? Um, what color is the baby's poop? Um, does the person who is lactating have nipple pain or is, are their breasts or nipples cracking and bleeding? Um, and then when the baby latches, does it hurt? So these are a lot of considerations. It's, you know, a silly little chart, but a lot of things go into this lactation um, and the nursing relationship. A lot of that is covered in the guide. Um, I also counsel people um, and am a lactation consultant. So there's that. Um, and then uh, this is what the lactation guide looks like. It's linked here as well. Um, if you do, um, you know, want to nurse your baby, you'll think about what your feeding goals are. Um, are you feeling up to nursing your baby? If you can, um, you want to notice if your breasts have changed. Oops, I'm sorry. If your breasts have changed during your pregnancy, can your baby latch? Um, do I know the signs of, of a tethered oral tissue, which is um, the, uh, the frenulums under your tongue, the frenulum under your, your lip um, or you know, top lip or bottom lip. And then there are four frenulums in the mouth, two on the top, um, two on the back and the cheek. So tongue tie, lip tie, cheek tie are tethered oral tissues. Um, the untrained person, sometimes even a pediatrician can't tell. Um, you want a lactation consultant um, to assess 
and refer you to an ENT to have um, this checked out if you do believe that there is a latching issue or a tethered oral tissue issue. Does my baby seem interested or does the baby seem interested in nursing at all? Um, so these are some of the things that you want to think about, um, you know, if you are lactating, if you are trying to nurse, or if you want to switch over to formula. Either way, again, the baby just needs to be fed, so there are no subpar feeding decisions either. Um, so again, this is, this is uh, linked as well, um, and I can send, I'm going to actually, I don't think I have it open um, in my browser, but I can also send just the, the hyperlink as well to, um, to Katie. Um, but if you would like to connect, that would be great. Um, my website is here. It's linked. Um, on, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. This is my email um, and my phone number. You can text this number or call it. Um, and again, this is going to be available um, through the Scarsdale Library. So if you need a, a, this presentation, um, you can certainly reference it or reach out to Katie for my contact information. I'm going to um, put it back in the chat, put this information in the chat as well, um, my phone number and uh, my email. Does anyone have questions? I know that was a lot of information in a very short amount of time, um, but if anyone has questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, anyone? Um I am, um, I'm expecting my first grandchild. My daughter is having, you know, having a baby. Uh, she's due at the end of June, June 20th. Uh -huh. Nice. And she lives out of town. She lives in Madison, Wisconsin. Hmm. So when she goes into labor, she's going to call me and then I'll, my husband and I will fly out. Oh, she nice. Yeah. She doesn't want a nurse or a doula. She doesn't want anyone, but she wants me. Yeah. So but I just, uh, basically tuned in tonight to see if I could learn anything to help to support her. That's very sweet of you to do. She's lucky to have you. Oh, thank you. I'm lucky to have her. And I also was a big proponent of, of breastfeeding. I, I breastfed my daughter for you know quite a while and very successfully. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping that she is as successful and I will encourage her to contact you know, a lactation consultant or La Leche if she needs to. But yeah. I'm just, you know, I, I don't know how uh, Michelle, you're expecting very soon. And I don't know how you're feeling about breastfeeding or pumping. And my daughter seems to be very talking a lot about pumping. And I just said, look, just, just let it come naturally. Don't overthink this. Just, you know, just try the nursing and see if that works. I, I... Yeah, this is my second with my first, um, I breastfed her uh, almost exclusively for the first mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. but, um, it was really hard in the beginning. I did my, I didn't have colostrum or milk that came in. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it was the first week was really challenging. And I think, um, everybody else in my family, sis, you know, my sister, my sister-in-laws, um, it, it seemed to come much easier for them. So mm. I guess I would just say, from my perspective, like if your daughter is having a hard time with it, um, for her to know that that's normal too. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't just happen so seamlessly for everyone. But I found personally that um, it was a really, you know, once, once it worked out, it was really special between me and my daughter. But um, I respect that everybody has different experiences with it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, the only thing that's important here is that the baby is fed, um, you know, so if it is too much on the person who is lactating, if they are so worn out, you know, that it's hurting their mental health, it's hurting their physical recovery, um, you know, it's okay to supplement and then try again, you know, if that's what they want. Um, there, I have a lot of really good, um, um, like tips and tricks for soothing and um, for healing, um, you know, a cracked nipple, a sore nipple, engorgement, um, you know, people deal with uh, mastitis or they deal with clogged ducts. 
um, and blebs as well. So um, there's there's a whole slew of things that can happen, um, even if you're not breastfeeding, right? If even if you have milk. Um, and you're not body feeding your baby, um, there are a whole other host of things that can go on at the same time, to be quite honest. There was a question in the chat about uh, formula shortage. And the only thing that I can really think of um, is supply chain. I've also heard about people having um, difficulty getting containers um, to store the, the formula in. So I think a lot of that is, um, you know, due to the pandemic and then just workers, honestly, and, and supply shortages. And hopefully it, it resolves itself pretty soon because people, I mean, I, on the Facebook groups that I'm a part of, um, and on social media, it's just people are begging, borrowing and, and, you know, dropping formula off here, dropping formula off there excuse me, and only some babies can have certain formulas um, and things like that. So hopefully it, it does resolve on its own. Mm -hmm. what, what is your feeling about um, the standard formula that you buy in a, in a CVS, Walgreens or one of that versus mm -hmm. like a goat milk formula versus a formula that you might get in a green market? Uh -huh. So um, in the US, the FDA has to approve, um, you know, the ingredients. So if it is FDA approved, um, they're all basically um, okay to give the baby, right? If the baby is colicky, if the baby has an allergy, um, you know, if if the, um, the lactating parent has allergies, that could also affect the child. So you know, it really is preference, first of all. So if the baby likes the goat formula, then go with the goat formula. If the baby can, you know, digest Similac, the regular run of the mill Similac, then, you know, that's great for Similac. I happen to really like, um, it's called Bobby, B-O-B-B-I-E. It's an organic formula um, that's out of Vermont. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had to get on a waiting list, I think this, this time last year for it. Um, but it's one of the best I recommend it to a lot of my clients and they, they happen to be very, um, happy with it. There is, um, palm oil in a lot of these formulas and oftentimes babies, um, are, um, allergic to the palm oil. Um, and it happens to be process of elimination in terms of we've tried this formula with these ingredients, this doesn't work, or my baby is constantly, uh, spitting up. We've tried this one and the baby is constipated. We've tried this one and the baby has a rash. You know, so a lot of people go through so much spending and so much the trials and tribulations of trying to find a good formula that, um, you know, it, it, it can be a little difficult, but palm oil seems to be the culprit in many of these situations, unfortunately. And that, and that is in some of the more common formulas like the Similac? Mm-hmm. Yep. It might be in Bobby. I haven't looked at the Bobby ingredients lately. Um, it could be, but again, Bobby happens to be people's favorites these days. So, or favorite these days. So it changes, you know, just like everything else. And you say there's a waiting list for that? There, last year there was. Oh, okay. Yep, last year there was. It was still fairly new. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I appreciate everyone's yes, time. Yes. Oh, in the yeah. chat, please. Yes. Oh, sorry. What if breastfeeding is interrupted for a period of time? Yes. So absolutely. Um, if there is a start and stop um, in the breastfeeding relationship, it can breast you know, the, the relationship, the nursing relationship can absolutely be um you know, resumed if there is a little bit of time. I mean, sometimes people stop for two weeks. If the lactating parent is um, still hand expressing or pumping or stimulating the breast in some way to keep milk production going, um, the nursing relationship can be um, resumed typically, right? Typically it can, it can happen. A lot of people get um, caught up in either nipple confusion or they think the baby forgets how to um, nurse, but typically that's not um, not not the situation. 